Proper Madness, formerly Beautifully Broken. My name is Savvy and I give a unique perspective on mental health by providing tools, guidance, and knowledge on how we can better understand ourselves as well as our past and present experiences and in doing so, we can help heal our mental health. I get to speak with a variety of individuals from around the world as they share their stories from their journey through their mental wellness so that it helps others stand strong and use their voice. Welcome back everyone to Proper Madness. Today I get to sit down with Glenn. Um, I met him through Instagram and I did one of his lives last week and it was such a great conversation that we decided to do another conversation on my podcast. So I have him here now and I'm very excited to chat with him. Thank you, Sabi. I'll just introduce myself. So my name is Glenn. I'm, I'm Irish. I'm from uh, Dublin, Ireland, but I'm now currently living in Paris. And yeah, it's just an absolute crazy journey how I got here. Um, it's probably like a movie or something like that. But <laughs> basically, uh, I'm here now because I actually went on a journey. I had a, uh, this is going to be mainly about panic attacks. And uh, so people don't know what agoraphobia is. I'll explain a little bit what agoraphobia is. Agoraphobia is like the fear of having a panic attack far away from home or in certain places where there's no escape or medical help or something like that. So I had agoraphobia as well, mixed in with the panic attacks. And that disorder um, was from age 18 to 28. So 10 years, um, I struggled with an anxiety disorder, panic attacks and agoraphobia. And I just turned 32 in February. So I'm just touching like four years recovered now. And, you know, I went from being unable to literally get on a bus back in Ireland. I couldn't get on a train, I couldn't drive, I couldn't get in the cars. I couldn't hold down a, a full-time job or a part-time job. I couldn't hold down relationships, missed out on so many like Mother's Days, birthdays, everything. Anxiety disorders do that to people. Okay, and yeah, that's basically where my life was. And again, I, I was almost completely housebound with the agoraphobia. I, I literally lived in a certain kilometer radius for a couple of years, like three kilometers is the furthest I went in many, many years, yeah. Of course, when I was 18 to age 28, the disorder went like, it was like spiked at the start and I went a normal level. And then mm-hmm. at the end, like, the last three years of my disorder from ages like 25 to 28 was just crippling for me. It got worse. Um, Cause I just felt there was no escape from me. You know, it was a very, very difficult thing to go through. And, you know, as a young man, you're not working and every relationship you get into is failing and you've no self-confidence. Yeah. I couldn't even, I was afraid to even jog and I'll get into that. Yeah, it was a 10-year anxiety disorder and now, you know, I went from, I began being unable to just do normal things to then get on my, because so my first panic attack happened at age 18 on holiday and I had, I had not been on a plane ever since. I was terrified of flying, but you know, I couldn't even get in cars. I didn't even think about flying. But um, I finally in 2019, I went on a recovery journey and I'm not thinking that'll get me to where I am today. I'll just start doing things that I just got so sick of fear. I was like, I'm not living like this anymore. There's no way I'm living like a rat stuck in a cage for another couple of years. No way. You know, with beautiful, beautiful people around me, Sabi, I my mom, my young, younger siblings, and you know my girlfriend in Paris. We get to that as well. But so many people who loved me, you know. And again, I had such respect for myself as well. I loved myself as a person, and I wanted that life. I wanted to do normal things again. So I went on that journey in 2019 to just. I literally had this effort mentality that come like because my fears, and I'm sure a lot of people if they listen to this and they have panic disorder or agoraphobia and anxiety. You can think that anxiety is going to kill you. You know, you think you're going to have a heart attack or a stroke or a seizure or go nuts, as they say, crazy, you know. Um, so I had all those fears for years. And I just I just thought they'd go eventually, like, but they just didn't. It just got worse, yeah. you know. Um, so in 2019, I just hit like a breaking point where like, I couldn't stop crying. So what what happened? What happened specifically for you to have that breaking point to go, all right, I'm done living like this and I want to improve. Yeah, it was a really important 
point of my life when so my dear friend's birthday is in uh, September okay and September 2019 I was around two or three months into my recovery at the time and like me and my girlfriend like I didn't I never met her before mm-hmm. face to face like yeah and we were talking for around four years oh and yeah That's so cute you now just talking all the time and you know it's um so I promised her that I'll get there for her birthday in September and mm-hmm. again I often do with like her family and her sisters and they're dying to meet me and like my girlfriend's just dying to meet me as well for the first time likewise so I tell her I'm coming in September and September comes and I tell her I'm not ready mm-hmm. I can't do it I said I can hardly walk down the street and back in Dublin how the hell am I gonna like oh, going nuts over in Paris like yeah not ready and I remember the, the look on her face and I when that happened then I remember just like it was just a horrible horrible experience like my whole life shattered I'm like this, this I'm not letting this take my life away mm. I'm 20 years of age no I'm not having this anymore and that was the breaking point for me and it, at that time, Savvy, I was still terrified. I was doing this, so I, was, I, I recovered basically. I jogged into my agoraphobic zones. So with me being unable to go three kilometers from home, mm-hmm. I started to run 5K, 6K. At the, at the end of the month, I was able to run 10K. And I remember one day um, after that call with my girlfriend, I still had those blockages of being unable to go far. Like I still had so much crap in my mind that I, I was terrified of going far from home and away from my safe person which was my mom mm. and it, you know I had all these behaviors savvy that I, I conjured up over the years and I had to break them down I really, I really had to I call it a psychological switch over and I remember then I remember um, one day it was a Sunday mm. and I decided um, I'm gonna run until my legs fall off I don't care <laughs> what me that's the mentality I went with. That's a yeah. very that's a key mentality in specifically overcoming anxiety and agoraphobia. You need yeah. to have that mentality of like, I don't care about it. No one panics never gonna kill you, but you must move forward into it. And I set out that day, Savvy, and the four of us are basically gone in around years, probably around six or seven years, it's like 10k from home. Oh man. Like a prison, yeah, yeah. Very I can't sad. even I don't know how to run. Well, I mean, I know how to run, but I'm not a fan of running. So when you say you were running like 5K, 6K, I was like, good on you. But still, yeah. but you're right to have that mentality is is key. I think uh, you posted a quote the other day. I reshared it because I was like, how true that is. You can't fear the panic and the anxiety and anything that you go through because the more you fear it, the more it's going to control you. Exactly kind of how you said. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, please, it's getting to that understanding of what actually panic is. Yeah what, yeah. is. what is the panic, you know? What is it? And we have an understanding of it. We know it's not going to kill us, so it can almost dampen down the reaction we have to, and then we go on a path to heal it. Mm-hmm. Um, but so I went out that day, and I decided I'm going to run, like, until my legs fall off, basically. And I remember saying to my mom, Mom, I've been jogging, I've been hitting 10Ks, and I'm going to jog today like I've never jogged before. And I said, not knowing where I was going to go or where I was going to end up. And it was a Sunday, a Sunday morning, and I ended up jogging 30 kilometers. Oh my and God. I was like, holy shit. Like, that was my <laughs> biggest fear to be far from home and having no escape. Now, here I am, miles away from home, and I jogged. There's no escape. And I went up a mountain as well. So oh, wow. I, um, I could see, like, I called my mom on the mountain. I was like, mom, look, guess where I am? And this mountain is a very specific mountain in Dublin, and it's beautiful. And I, my family always go to it, the, the young kids and my young cousins, and I'm always the fucking one left at home. Mm. Always. I'm, those small things you miss out on life. Yeah. And here I was jogging up to it. So you can understand the whole psychology shift that was going on in my mind. So basically, sadly, what happened was, I'll speed this up a little bit for you. Um, when I was coming home, I checked um, my watch, and I couldn't believe I jogged 20 kilometers. I could not believe it. And me having just been not just being like new to running, I didn't really know what, how much a marathon was or whatever. So I googled I wonder how much a marathon is because 20 kilometers sounds quite a lot. Yeah. And then I realized, oh shit, a marathon's like 40 <laughs> or something. And I was like, oh, shit. 
I just jogged my heart out. Um, but then I, I, I looked up and I seen the, the Dublin Marathon starting in three weeks. And I said, well, I'm going to do that. And I actually signed up for the half marathon, which is 22 kilometers. Um, oh, my God. That's bananas. I don't know how. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's crazy because when, when I first started this journey, Sabi, I couldn't run around my, my neighborhood. I couldn't run one kilometer. I kept going home panicking or running it to my local fire brigade station because there's paramedics in it. That's how bad it was for me. These fears controlled my life. And I remember I then signed up for the marathon. I went home and said, man, I'm going to do the marathon. She's like, okay, brilliant. Great. Let's do it. And, you know, so speed of three weeks, here I am. My uncle drops me into uh, right in the middle of the city center in Dublin. I went on my own. Didn't want anyone to do with me. Just went on my own. This is about me versus me. Mm-hmm. And I went in and I completed the Dublin marathon. And, you know, my, my mom and my um, little cousins and you know, my aunties and all were waiting at the finish line for me and uh, it was just a great feeling, you know, and I felt I had my life back. And then driving home in the car, I went on to book my flights to Paris. I didn't tell my girlfriend and I just booked them and then I sent out the, the ticket. I said, I'm coming to see you this day next month. And speed up, this day next month finally came on 18th of October 2019. I took my first flight to Paris to meet my girlfriend oh my gosh crazy right oh that's so but that's so like that's so mm. cool it's so sweet though as well that 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 drive and that like love that you have for her but also for yourself to like do that you know to yeah. break out of your comfort zone and go enough is enough because our emotions just completely can take over our lives what we do what we miss out on everything like you said and i pre thank you for sharing that story yeah that's pretty powerful i feel like it's very powerful yeah because yeah, that's the mentality you need to have you have to um you can yeah, only really you help can. yourself if if you want to and if you have the drive to do it you know exactly what you just said there a few minutes ago you said you wouldn't be able to run i guarantee your life depended on you to run well yeah if my, that's what my it, life depended that's what it on was it for me my short legs would be like, okay, let's go. You know, if a murderer was chasing after me, then probably I'd probably run. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that was uh, a little, little, t- little T-Rex legs. So small. I'm only, f- I'm five one. So wow. yeah, I'm tiny, Super small. I'm tiny. I'm a tiny human. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, uh, when you first had your panic disorder mm-hmm. and agoraphobia, do you know what started it or, um, what triggered it? Was it your whole life? No, right? Or no, no, yeah, completely, completely normal to well, normal. <laughs> yeah, I like to think I was well, up till around eighteen. My when I had my first panic attack at age eighteen, my whole life changed. So, mm. oh, totally changed. But of course, coming back, what's given to you? I was well, therapy was given to me. So, um, you know, I I, I kind of knew where this came from, but I never I suppressed a lot. From childhood and I f- then I know how it happened so when I was seven years old a young boy yeah I was lying in bed and I heard my mom scream and crying oh fuck yeah and then I my dad was beating her up and my stepdad sorry it only happened once never happened again but it was enough to emotionally damage me and mm. um, as, as a young kid and I adapted all these behaviors then because what happened was when I was seven, of course, very young. Um, and you know what? I don't even think it was seven. I just have that number in my mind. I'm only thinking of that now. I don't know what age it was. Just very, very young. <laughs> yeah. Anytime I say that story, I say I was seven. I really don't know. No, I, I had the seven. same. Don't worry. You know, I just, I just ballpark. Seven. Just ballpark. Yeah, that happened. I remember getting out of bed and I put my hand on the handle and I was thinking, well, I open this door and if I can open it, I'll stop it. But if I open it, I kind of had like an inner wisdom, like don't open the door. Someone just mm-hmm. said, don't open it. And I went back to bed, put the pillow over my head and started to cry um, to myself to sleep. So being a young kid then, uh, Sabi, when I wanted to stay in someone's house, like three doors down and my best friends or my aunties down the road, like 10 minutes away, I could never stay in anyone's house. Oh, I was, man. Yeah, I'd cry in the middle of the night as a kid, like even in my teens, like 12, 13, 14. I'd be sleeping in my auntie's house like, 
um, be like 2 a.m. ready to go to sleep, and I'd walk into my energy room crying, I need to go home, I need to go home. Um, mm-hmm. And I never said, listen, this is what happened as a kid. I just suppressed it all. And then fast forward then, I was around 16, I got my first girlfriend, and again, child love, or whatever the hell you call it, teenage love, whatever. I totally yeah. forgot about it. It was gone. And plus my, my father, my stepdad moved out as well, so he was gone at, when I was 17. So fast forward on with my girlfriend, my ex-girlfriend, um, we went to Lanzarote on our first um, holiday together. Mm-hmm. And then I'm lying in bed and I have this massive panic attack because I feel I'm too far away from my mum. Oh, it was the worst feeling in the world. Oh, my God. Um, no, I never knew what a panic attack was. I thought there was something really wrong with me. Um, so that's where it all happened for me. So, mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. the importance of understanding our, the impact of our childhood and how, it's an, it, how our mind and body interprets it later is mm-hmm. intense. But that must have a lot to go through. It is. It's fascinating. I wish more people understood that. That... Um, mm-hmm even the smaller incidences in our childhood, which I'm sorry you had to deal with that as a kid. That's very scary and very difficult. But, mm. um, but even like anything is that shakes our nervous system like that is technically trauma. Exactly. You know, my, my, my central nervous system, my fight and flight was in, you know, it was activated at such a young age. I should have, that should have been nurture and care and love and safety. And mm. don't get me wrong, I had plenty of that. But that yeah. was just one, that one situation, then I was almost predisposed to having an anxiety disorder later on in life. Because of the behaviors I picked up then, you, you develop this mm. sort of codependence relationship to my mom. And um, I was wanting to make sure she's safe. And I remember as a kid, like being 16, and I was extremely good at football, Sabi and we were going like over to Amsterdam to play football. All oh. my team went, and I was, I was the only guy, only young kid not to go. Oh. And I remember like, looking back now I'm like wow like it really impacted me so much because I just didn't want to be away from my mom but I always put it down to on homesick because I never wanted to admit what happened because my mom and dad were still living together you know yeah. and it was only when I had the panic attack I remember coming home to my mom and I was like mom I think I know why I had the panic attack I'll tell you in the morning and you come on a walk with me I mean we, we went on a walk the next morning after my panic attack and when I got a flight home from Lanzarote I was supposed to be there for two weeks and I lasted like what 40 hours or something I was at home and, <laughs> yeah and I remember saying to my mom the next day because like, you think I think to myself like, did that happen did that happen I need to ask her you know and then my mom she 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 denied it straight away like and she just I said mom please I need to know because I, I heard of it you know and mom's like okay she opened up about it and you know it was just, she was very young at the time my mom had me at age 16 my mom oh, gave birth wow. to me at 16 yeah my mom's yeah. only 40, my mom's 49, I think, yeah. Mm. Um, so, you know, she would have been, what, if I was seven, my mom would have been, what, 23, is it? So, so oh, wow. Such a young age, like, you know, such a young age. Like, and that, you know, I have to think about that as well. And again, that one traumatic event, I had so much love, you know, and so much nurture from like, my mom, you know, I, um, all my family, you know, so almost saved. I could, it could have been worse for me. Mm. Um, but it's a really, it's a crazy story like to where I am now in Paris. Like it's, you know. Yeah. Well, now the the <sighs> your the whole your whole like um, uh, like your social media handle makes sense now from Panic to Paris. <laughs> so now I'm like, yeah. oh, that makes sense. But it's very, I, I like it. I like that it's sentimental and meaningful in that way. And now you're using it as a platform to help other people. That's amazing. Yeah, it really is. It's important work, you know, especially from someone, you know, when I was going through my disorder, I felt like I could could only relate to people who went through it. Mm. You know, you just have that connection towards that person. You're like, he knows or she knows what that's like. To lie in bed shaking with the fears, to think you're going crazy and calling bloody ambulances to your house. And Oh, my God, you know, I was so tired from this. I lost so much weight, Sabi. I went, I my know, face I was remember like, seeing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. I it was seeing, like a skeleton. No, I, I saw, because I remember when I first started like talking to you and like we, like, you know, we connected. I like yeah. obviously went through your social media. I was like, oh my God, he like put on so much weight. Like, you look mm. really good. I can imagine though, because like of the sheer anxiety and um, not being able to eat or sleep or. 
It's just the place is tall. You know, yeah. I'd, I'd be I'd be fine for a couple of weeks or months, you know. I'd, but that was in my safe zone, you know. I'd be around this three kilometer radius, it's not feeling anxiety, you know. I thought it's crazy how something so abnormal becomes normal. It's normalized in your mind then. Stay here, mm-hmm. stay in this zone of comfort, but you're missing out on life in it. My, since I was 18 and I turned 28, I'm like, where did that go? <laughs> that's a that's a decade of my life. Yeah. You know, but trust me, I'm making up for it now. I guarantee you that. <laughs> But um, I've lived, I've lived, you know, I've lived more and experienced more in three and a half years than I've ever probably experienced in my life. So your recovery journey, what did that look like for you? Like if anyone's listening and they, they don't know where to start in their recovery and they, you know, their story is resonating or your story is resonating with them recovery wise, like, what was that like for you? Recovery. I started without, I started in the, with the, the mindset of like, okay, I really, I started and not think I'm going to even recover because I was stuck with it for 10 years, but I knew if I start to do this, at least I can improve my life in some way. At least I can get out of the three kilometer radius that I lived in. Yeah. You know, I, had, I needed to break that at least or get enough stable to get a full-time job, you know, and then if I can get to that place, let's see what happens. So I didn't start I didn't go into it with a mindset like I'm gonna get on an airplane. Mm. I was terrified. I couldn't. I couldn't run around my block. I'd be terrified because I was again terrified of heart attacks. What happens in the jog? <laughs> Jogging exercise is like a panic attack. But I, I desensitized myself to it on so many jogs. But what's the best advice I can do is you know if you're someone that struggled, what I'm struggling, and this really relates to you, you know deep down that. It's work. You need to put in work to overcome this. You don't think yourself out of these disorders. You don't. It's behavior that makes it that part of the brain is watching your every move. You have to create that psychological switch over. And from my experience, as someone who's lived it and had it for a full decade of my life, you have to break it down slowly. You don't need to jump on trains and planes and all sorts of things and run in and get that full-time job and go back to college. You don't need to do that. If you're struggling with agoraphobia and you have a certain, like you have build up with so many areas that you fear, start tackling the small ones. If there's a local park, go to it. I mean, I went to it when I was in my recovery, I was at it every day. Mm. I did something every day, Sabi. And what, ha- what would happen is I'd get to my three kilometer radius, okay? And the first month, I, I still couldn't get past the three kilometer radius. I mm. still couldn't get it. There was this traffic light. And that traffic light to me was like a dungeon. A traffic light. I just felt like it because I got so used to if, if you take a straight road and if you take a right, there's a, there's a hospital and there's a, my auntie's house and there's a fire brigade station. So just help that way. I was going that way for so many years. Uh, but this way, this yeah, this way has nothing. But it has a forest. It has close to the to the sea. It's just more beautiful. But it's scary for me. And that traffic light was down that way. And I was terrified of that. That's the that's how the mind works with these panic attacks and agoraphobia. Mm. You know, I wasn't afraid of a traffic light. I wasn't afraid of a bus or a car. I wasn't afraid of that. I was afraid of how I felt in that car, in that train, past that traffic light. I was felt of these bodily sensations. I wasn't necessarily afraid of the object or the, the car. Mm. So I started to break those down and then I started to get past that traffic light in the second month. And then that traffic light became the seaside. And then I became over and over. And then within three months, as I said, in my fourth month, I jogged 20 kilometers from home. And in my fourth month, I got on, I done the marathon. And then the fifth month, I got on a plane. In five months, mm-hmm. a 10 year anxiety disorder that crippled my life for 10 years overcome completely like my, my, my anxiety in the fourth and fifth month were on zero. That's my advice for people. Don't put these big expectations. Just get to work. Just yes. chop, chip away at, at, just chip away at, you know, if you're terrified of a car, take your car out and go around the block, yeah. park it somewhere and sit there, break it. And you're going to feel horrible because at the start of my disorder, I still had all my panic attacks and sometimes they came on a bit worse. Um, at the start because I was 
put myself in almost traumatic places and you know, just down the road and there's literally safety everywhere but my mind didn't think that way because that's how I conditioned it for 10 years so that's my advice for people start slow that's with anything right you can't I think Absolutely. a lot of people think that there's an overnight remedy for everything and there really isn't it's just the mm. amount of time and consistency you put into something and then your mindset like you said you have to switch your mindset and have mm. a goal and your desire and discipline just need to be aligned big time Sally, 100%. Yeah. you know I, I never knew what the hell this one was never knew <laughs> i really didn't i had no right. clue what it was and yeah. then when I, when I actually got this one in my life i was like holy shit this changed the game for me mm. got my life back literally got my life back in five months and that uh, i always i always say this to people to reassure them if you're someone that's gone through about 10 years or five years it's not going to take you years to get no. out of this. That's no. how neuroplastic the brain is, you know? So, Yeah, well, yeah, but mine was the same. I just had a, like a moment where my mindset switched, you know, where it was very much a, okay, I'm sick and tired of feeling this now and I don't want to feel this ever again. So what am I going to do? I'm going to try my best to recover in whatever way I need to. And I definitely found like a, a big difference between myself and the place that I went to. I went with like, there are other people there, but could I say that the other people who went that they're in the same place that I am in recovery wise, some of them know someone backwards um, yeah. and it happens, but at the same time, it's the mindset you have and your why and your drive. I, I'm, I'm the opposite of you. I, I've always known discipline, but I never mm. like, like, I've always had a really good discipline with fitness and working out. That was like something that religiously I always stuck to. Um, so I, was, I understood. I of it. Oh, yeah, it's. Uh, Anything that got my heart real, but I was staying away from that for oh, that's... not a chance. Jeez, I didn't know that. <laughs> now, I can, now I love it. Wild. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now mm. it's an addiction. Now if I don't do oh, yeah. it, I feel different. Like mentally, I feel a little different. Um but no, I always grew up with discipline. I never translated it, though, to self-growth. I just always kept yeah. it as in their own categories of, like, fitness or whatever sport I was playing. So It's the key to everything, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Everything is the key to everything. You know, now I'm obsessed with, you know, I love the likes of David Goggins and Jocko Willink and these, you know, these... People are so disciplined that I just I respect that so much because it's so hard. It's so difficult. And, you know, as you said there about your recovery, Savvy, and, and my own, there's only a certain amount of pain, depression, loneliness that you, that you can take before you say, fuck this. Yeah. I'm getting my life back. You know, there's only, everyone has, has that rock bottom. You might have a couple of them, but there is certain moments where we're like, enough is enough. Because mm -hmm. some, sometimes we are doing it to ourselves, you know, we are. You know, not in all cases, you know, just some really horrific cases and certain people with trauma and abuse and stuff like that. And it's very unfair. But a lot of it, like for me, I knew, this is down to me. I'm keeping myself stuck. Me. I can blame my father. I can blame. I can blame people. But what's that going to do? Yeah. I have to take, you know, I have to take ownership. I have, this is me. This is my life that's passing by. I have to get it back. And there's only so much depression and anxiety I take when it's like, you know, I'm done with this. Yeah. I just went on that journey, you know. Yeah. How is it? Crazy. How is it been? Well, yes, yeah. How, yeah. Uh, how has it been starting your platform? How was that? That must have been like a whole different. <sighs> like what, what caused you to even want to get into that too, into helping other people and coaching them? Well, this is the last thing I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I swear, because when I was so sick of that word anxiety and panic, I hated it because that's all I had for 10 years. And then I remember as I was getting on in recovery, I literally, when I think I was like two or three months into my recovery, I was like, you know what, I'm not even, I put my whole, I have about a thousand books on the bloody, so probably around 100 on anxiety and panic. And I look, they're getting straight, they're going right up to my attic. So I put them all in a box and I put them in my attic there at home in Dublin still. Every every person I followed on Instagram to do it, anxiety, gone, unfollowed. Everyone on YouTube, unsubscribed, gone. I didn't want to hear it. I was on my journey and I was focused on that. Mm. But I did have a, a YouTube account and I was posting a little 
you know, just about clear weeks walks and my, you know, jogging journey and stuff like that. And I only had like 30 followers or something. It was just very basic. But I had like a couple of videos up there that I literally forgot about. And when I took my flight to Paris then, um, I remember I then made a video about like, guys, I can't believe what happened. I still have that video up. And that was in October 2019. And so many people were getting in touch with me. Glenn, this is amazing. Can you make a video? And this changed my life. And again, like, this is, okay, cool, great. I'm, I'm happy for that, <laughs> you know, but uh, to make yeah. another video, I'm just, to be honest, I was just enjoying life, Sadie. Mm. I couldn't believe where I was, like, and I was just not interested in anything got to do with anxiety. But uh, over time, so as I kept traveling to France for the first time in October, mm. I went back in November, I went back in December, and every time I'd go back, I'd be lying in bed and I'd, you know, my girlfriend be there and I'd be like, oh, look, I'm about to get another message off YouTube. Look, look at that. It's so nice to receive that. Like, people are saying I changed their life. Wow. And then my girlfriend says, you should be like, you know, you should do something to help people. Mm. You know, and be like a coach ourselves. I was like, no, no. But then the message kept flooding. And I was like, wow, this is like, like, these were really powerful messages. Not just thank you and, you know, have a good day. Are really really powerful and i was like maybe i will and i remember just setting up a page and you know it got into my mind then and my friend when i my friends and you know my friends had such a, a great great laugh over in ireland and when i was with them like one of my friends says mentioned off oh, from panic to paris or something and i was like it's actually a cool name <laughs> no that's brilliant yeah oh my god yeah, yeah, yeah. so i'll give him props sorry his name is Dave. <laughs> but I, when I say to Dave, it's like, no, that wasn't me. I said, Dave, what was you? But then, um, yeah, and I just set it up and start coaching people. And here it is, and it's just it's booming now. It's fantastic. And I'm working with a lot of people now. And more, most importantly, to get results. To get results, like going from not a lady recently hadn't worked the job in seven years, and she's literally working now. Oh, wow. You know, she hadn't got in the car and driven her kids further than what I was to a two mile radius. Now she's driving 25, 30 miles, 40 miles. So it's that type of work that I look, wow. That's amazing. That's why, yeah, you know, and it's, it's, um, I try my best to give, I know people say, I say this a lot, like, oh, I try to get back to what I want or what I need back then. But I really do try and give back to get it to, truly like getting into people's you know really like almost calls every day like did you do this did you do that because that's what helped me it's the discipline not to leave them alone and say okay you do that mm. they will get to that point when they do it themselves but the first month i take them to i'm like yeah are you doing it messing me when you do it do it get back call me so it's that type of discipline and then um, because for me that's what works yep, yep. it's, it's yep. great yep. you know I agree wholeheartedly. And we got some really weird questions on Glenn's live in regards to alcohol. Like everyone chimed in. We we talked a little bit about our um, substance, I guess, alcohol abuse that we lean towards in our unhealthier moments and our mental health as like a coping mechanism. Um, but yeah, I, I told my a little bit of my story, I think, but you didn't tell me yours. So you, now you got to tell me yours. I've been I've been sober eight years now, uh, Sabi. Wow. Um, that's one of the blessings that has come with my anxiety disorder. Um, you know, as, as I said to you, like growing up in Dublin, Ireland, you know, everything's just alcohol. Everything is alcohol. There's no escape from it. Mm. Um, from a very young age, it's morphed into you. You know, you even see young kids, like newborn babies, like getting pictures yeah. taken beside them with, with points of Guinness, like, <laughs> you know it's really crazy but um it was the best decision of my life personally and um, it was just too bad like i was just i would literally like i'd go out i i like to think on many occasions i drink less than my friends i think they drank harder like i like vodka and whiskey and i'd be just drinking beer and i just the panic the next day almost like this is just too much for me. I'd be crippled in bed. And the next day, my mates were knocking down and ready to go out again. I'm like, are you serious? Like, I'm, mm-hmm. I haven't eaten. I haven't moved out of bed. 
And then I was like, is my body different? Or why, like, how? Like, it's not possible for them to not get hangovers, like, we're the same age, but, yeah. but it, was, it, was my, it was my mindset I was stuck in, you know? And, and eventually, I just, my hangovers were so crippling. I just, I just even my mom said, yeah, like, you have to go alcohol. I was, I was never a heavy drinker. You know, I just drank like the normal person in Dublin, Ireland. That's probably I considered a heavy drinker, actually. Yeah, that's what I was <laughs> but, uh, say. It's crazy. I see people drinking here in Paris, okay? Mm. They have uh, like two bottles of beer. Oh, I and they know. Put, they, yeah, they put them neatly in the cardboard beside the bin. In Ireland, you have to buy a crate of 24 cans. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm serious. Yeah. 24 bottles of 24 cans. It's nuts, That's you know, and um, so yeah, growing up in that type of environment, there's no escape from it. Um, I remember going on my, my journey to uh, giving up alcohol, and I failed mm-hmm. so many times. I, I used to have a journal, so I still have the journals back at home, and um, I look in them, um, very not regularly, but at least once a year, I'd go back and be like, I can't believe that's the same person, and I'd be writing things in the journal, sadly, and I'd be like. I don't know, what's it, 2014 or something? I don't know. Um, would it be 2014? I think it is, yeah, when I gave up alcohol. It's eight years. Yeah, that's bad. Yeah, 2014. I think it was around May, April, May time. So around this time, yeah. And I remember looking back in the journal and I was like, uh, can't believe I'm three months sober now and stuff like that. And then I'd go back in time to months prior to another journal and I'd be like, Definitely staying in tonight and feel much better without drinking. No panic attack today. And then I'd fold up the page. Can't believe I went out tonight. I'm actually dying with a hangover. I feel depressed. And uh-huh. <laughs> and then I'd, I'd fast forward a couple of pages. Like, okay, two weeks off without alcohol now. Feel much better. Definitely going to do it this time. I'm at least going to get to the month. Scroll over the page. Can't believe I've done it again. Can't believe we went out. <laughs> you know, and it was so many failures. And then eventually, I was like, again, there's so much pain. And they're like, that's it. That's enough. I'm done with this. Mm. Um, and then a month, two months, six months, a year, eight years. Wow. Yeah. wow. It was funny looking back and that mindset I was in, like, definitely giving it up. And then the next page, can't believe <laughs> I'm depressed day to day. Yeah, it's <laughs> funny looking back on it. That's with, that's I think great. that's with everything, though, like... Um there were so many times that like I tried to fully give up alcohol, but then peer pressure or something would happen. Like my friends would be going out and I'd I'd be like, Oh no, I'm not drinking. And then you'd have that one friend that just tried, well, friend, not a real friend if they do this. Um, And they say, well, why aren't you drinking? What, like what's wrong with you? And then you feel pressured. Like, Oh, I'll just have one. I'll be fine with one. And then one doesn't stay one. So. Yeah. I lose yeah. Yeah, alcohol, I, I think, is such a big, big problem for people, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. It really is. And it's the gateway drug. And of course, alcohol is a drug for people who don't know that. Um, it's the gateway drug into other substances, you know. And, you know, I, I remember when I was doing research on alcohol when I was like a couple of years sober, and like, I feel so much better. I, I give it up because of panic attacks. I still mm-hmm. bloody got the panic attacks, but at least I felt. I felt a little bit better, you know. Um, but I remember looking up and I, I seen the in Arabic it's it means uh, uh, it's pronounced al mm-hmm. and it means body it means body eating spirit. And I was doing my research on it and I'm like it makes sense, you know, that when you drink so much you become a different person almost. And mm-hmm. a lot of people do it really it really takes them out of their body and into their traumas and into their pain and tears start to flow and fights start to happen. And, you know, I remember being up in, in one of the hospitals in Ireland like, for a panic attack. And oh, wow. I remember, yeah, like just, it wasn't even a panic attack, it was just anxiety. And when I went to the hospital, I'd have no anxiety. So I was like, I want to call an ambulance and, you know, go up to the hospital and see what they can do for me. They never done anything for me, but they, at least I was calm up there. And I remember going out and it was like 3 a.m. or something like that. And there was security guards like patrolling the area that are like um, security that in all hospitals. I remember just talking to them and they were so nice, like so cool. And I was talking about anxiety and panic and, you know, they, they were saying that like, 
about their job and they're like, you know what? We see people getting in and out of the ambulances and like it must be tough here sometimes with drunken people. He's like, Glenn, you, you knew my name then. We asked a couple of questions about like my name, where I'm from, and stuff like that. He's like, Glenn, you know, nine nine out of ten or ninety percent of the people up here, it's all because of alcohol. If there was no drink here, we probably wouldn't even have jobs. It's mm-hmm. all alcohol related, you know. And it's the same in every country, so not just Ireland. Unfortunately, there's that stigma of alcohol still of like it, it's a way for people to feel better about themselves socially like they feel like they need to drink to have a good time and have fun and loosen up and that's just putting a band-aid over so many things like if you need feel the need to drink to have fun and loosen up and then you go overboard and then you end up in the hospital like it's not that's not worth it you know what I mean it's not worth it in any way so no. you know it really isn't there's so much wisdom and pain Yes, there is. Mm. Isn't that nuts? Yeah. It is. That nuts. Yeah, you can just communicate and feel on a different level, you know? But my last little question is, if there's anyone out there that, um, I said this in the beginning, that like you feel resonates, like what would you say? But if you were to tell yourself something that you wish you had known when you were younger, what, what would it have been? I would say in the, uh, probably two things. Don't be afraid to fail. Almost fail more. And do what's hard. Mm. Do what's hard. I like that. Thank you so much for coming on. It was nice to have you. You're so welcome. I'm very honored to be here. So, Yeah, you can find me on my social media. I just mainly operate off Instagram. Uh, my name is From Panic to Paris. And you'll find me on there. And, you know, if you're anyone that's struggling with panic disorder or agoraphobia, yeah, I'm thinking you'll find a lot of top, top information there. So from Panic to Paris is the account. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, you have to go through the eye of the storm to see the clear horizon ahead. Thanks so much, guys, and I'll see you next week.